Coming up today on the show, it is my pleasure to welcome into the show Seahawks' Brendan Nelson. You have asked for it. Today you're going to get it. He does as much work on the draft as anybody out there. We're going to talk about some of his favorite prospects, what he sees the Seahawks potentially doing if they stick at 16 or move down, some guys he likes later in the draft, a potential curveball that he could see realistically happening and then we're going to take dane brugler's mock draft today posted on the athletic a full seven round full nfl draft we're going to take the seahawks list and break it down one of the more intriguing drafts out there from some of the national guys that do this brendan nelson joining me next on seahawks forever welcome to the seahawks forever podcast in-depth analysis on everything seahawks and now here's your host Dan Vienz. Be sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel, and hit the bell so you always get notified of future episodes. If you prefer audio podcasts, you can subscribe on any platform, but on Spotify, you can listen to episodes ad-free for a small monthly fee. I'll put that link in the description. Or if you just want to support the channel, support the show, you can either buy me a beer or a coffee as Tony in Montana did, sending me a case of seven Montana brewed beers. I'm about five-sevenths of the way through that, all delicious so far. Or if you see that super thanks button down at the bottom of the screen, you can just contribute that way as well. Don't want to waste any time. Let's get into this. This was uh, this has been requested by you guys for a long time, and we have gone back and forth, finally got our schedules synced up. Brendan Nelson, Talk and Draft on today's show. So, Brendan, my viewers have been asking for you for quite a while. Your name started popping up in my comments uh, a while back, and uh, I've certainly been a fan of yours as well and, and love what you and Brandon do together, the Brendan and Brandon uh, collab. So thanks for taking the time, and uh, it's a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, thank you, Dan. I'm happy to be here. It's, ex it's an exciting time of the year for us football fans. It is. We are uh, Matt Hasselbeck days away from the, uh, from the first round of the NFL draft Seahawks sitting at 16. Let's get right into it. It's, you know, when you do what you and I do, you're probably like me where we over, we analyze and then we overanalyze. And then there there's been a, I've kind of run into this interesting wall the last week where I've sort of shut down and I just kind of take a step back. And then just in the last 24 hours have kind of started going back, looking at some film again, looking at some of my notes, kind of reevaluating after taking a deep breath, as we sit here today, the Seahawks sitting at 16, then they don't pick again until 81. What's your sense of, first of all, what you want them to do, the pick that would make you the most excited, but also what you think they might do kind of based on all the tea leaves we've been trying to read? Well, reading the tea leaves is tough because we know this is the season for misdirection. We know that there's going to be a lot of deception, and there should be. They shouldn't be honest with us. They shouldn't tell us what they're planning on doing. They shouldn't tell anybody what they're planning on doing. And to a certain extent, when you're picking 16th, you shouldn't really know what you're doing because you don't know what's going to be available to you. Um, with that being said, I do like the idea of a trade down simply because I'm wondering I'm not 100% sure, but I'm wondering if there's going to be a guy available at 16 that I feel like the team has to pounce on. Because yeah. I've looked at this draft a lot. It's not a bad draft. There's some stuff in this draft that is really good. But a lot of the really strong positions are also positions that the Seahawks have kind of put themselves in a position where they kind of can't go after it right now because of the way their roster is currently set up. So... With that being the case, I think that there is a decent chance that when we get to 16, there's nothing that really revs our engine all that much. Yeah. So I would like to get back in that second round. Uh, there are many players in that second round area that I think would be really, really good pickups, some very necessary pickups even. And I suspect that is where they're leaning. Now, I hope they're not already committed to it because we've seen this before. This team has gone into a draft clearly wanting to trade down no matter what. And the trade down offer they get ends up being very poor. I'm thinking specifically about um, 20, I believe it was 2019, that draft when they traded down significantly in the first round and only got like two fourths out of it. That's not what you want to do. You don't want to be married to that idea because you don't know what the offers are going to be. But I do think that there is going to be some kind of a trade down. And unless the draft breaks in a very particular way, I'm certainly happy with that. 
Yeah, I'm the same way. I, you look at this draft, and this could be said any year, especially if you don't have a second round pick. That you know, the meat of the draft in in many cases is on the second day, and the, there's so many players, not only that I like in rounds two and three, but that would fit uh, what we think they're going to do anyway, both on defense and offense. And in a couple of particular position groups, the fall off after the third round is pretty severe. Um, but there are some guys that I like at 16, and and before we get into some trade down possibilities, are there a couple of names of 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 players that you would particular think that realistically might be there at sixteen, right? If Caleb Williams falls to sixteen, right, we can all say we'd stick and pick for that. But uh, that you in particular would run to the podium, turn the name in, blue chip player, don't look back. Um, definitely. Like to me, the ultimate dream is Brock Bowers, and I say that name. <laughs> Because I do actually think that's a possibility at this point. Sure I do like. actually think that it's on the table. And I don't know why. To me, he is the best tight end prospect of my lifetime in terms of what he is bringing into the draft at the point of him getting drafted. I'm not saying he's going to be the best tight end ever. But as a prospect, it's hard to beat what he's bringing to the table here. To me, he's clearly a top five guy in this draft. And if you have the chance to get him at 16, I don't think you can pass that up. I understand that we have a couple of pretty capable tight ends on this team right now. I know we just gave Noah Fant that contract, but Bowers to me is too good. So that to me would be the dream. And I don't know how in what universe this league is going to allow him getting down to 16, but it sounds like it's at least a possibility to me. That's the dream. Um, I'd say Dallas Turner is one who I don't think mm -hmm. the league is going to allow him to get to 16, but I don't think I can pass that up if he gets down there. That combine to me solidified him as a clear top 10 player in this draft. And if he somehow manages to get down there, then I, I think I got to pounce on that as well. Um, some of the guys who I think would be a really tough call would be a guy like uh, Rome Odunze, who I think is a top eight player in this draft. But at the same time, I understand that our receiver position is pretty well sewn up for the moment. So that would be a point where it would be really tough for me to say no, but it's also tough to say yes at the same time, right? It's just one of those things where you have to really weigh that BPA versus need in your mind. Um, and, you know, I kind of do the same thing with a guy like Quinion Mitchell, who I love. I think he's easily the best corner in this class. But at the mm -hmm. same time, I'm like, do we need another corner? That's a little bit tough. And... um those are the guys who I think can realistically slip to our pick that I would probably have to pounce on. Obviously, if one of the three quarterbacks slips, I think I probably have to jump on that as well. Yeah. But I've been pretty adamant for a while now that one way or another, there are going to be three quarterbacks gone in the top three, and I'm going to stick to that for the time being. It's it's one of the most fascinating things about this draft is that there are a couple of players and Bowers being the prime example that in a normal year, you wouldn't expect to be there at 16 because they're just too good. I mean, guys that, 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 that have the kind of production tests like he did and are universally respected and considered to be a blue chip talent. But when you have a number of quarterbacks, premium positions, quarterbacks, offensive tackles that, you know, every, everybody needs one. Everybody wants one that those, those players get pushed to the top of the draft board. And there might be a player that falls to 16 that might not normally for me. And, and we'll get into this a little bit, cause we're going to, we're going to critique Dane Brugler's, full seven round mock and his Seahawk haul a little bit later. And I might be tipping my hand and giving something away here. The, the guy for me at 16 is Troy Faltanu because, you know, I talked about how I took a deep breath and went back and watched some tape and I put the tape on. I'm like, I'm, I'm taking that guy. I, I think he's a, he, he's a bona fide, bona fide all pro. We'll talk about him a little bit more, but I just don't think he's going to be there at 16 is the thing. I mean, all these mock drafts that have him going to us and a lot of these national ones do, I just, I see him going as high as 10 to the jets. I just don't see him being there. I think he's that good. And so then I get into this group of players where, yeah, I'd take him at 16 if I can't get a, a, a decent trade back, but I'd really rather not. And that's not exactly the definition of stick and pick. So I'm with you. I'd prefer to trade down if they do, then who were some guys kind of in those early to mid twenties that you'd be targeting and, and looking at for some value if you were able to get a good trade? Well, I think one of the interesting questions with this uh, class is you're looking at this really, really impressive right tackle collection. Yeah. You've got three clear first round guys at right tackle. 
And I think one of the things you do is you look at those guys and you ask yourself, do I think any of these guys can play guard? Right. Do I think any of them can play left guard? That way, not only do you have a short-term left guard, you might have a long-term right tackle because we don't know what's going on with Abraham Lucas right now. Mm -hmm. George, having George Fant is great, but it's a two-year deal and he's an older player anyway. <laughs> so um, I, I think that would be a really good one. You've got Fuaga, you've got Mims, you've got Latham. If you look at those three guys and you say to yourself, okay, which one of these guys is going to be able to play left a guard in, for the time being? If you find that guy and he's available in that range, I think you would definitely go that way. Um, I think you could bump down a little bit into that 20 range. I would be pretty on board with Graham Barton if you can't get Fatanu. Hmm. I think Graham Barton is yeah. the best pure left guard in this draft. And I say that because I think Fatanu is a left tackle. So hmm. um, if you're just looking at guys who I think are clearly going to be playing on the interior, I think Barton is the best. Uh, I'd also be interested in a guy like uh, Cooper DeJean who I know we met with the other day. Yeah. Uh, I know that is a pick that would get some people pretty worked up because oh, yeah. he just took a cornerback. Right. But I really like him. I think he would be a great fit for what Mike McDonald wants to do on this defense. And I think he would have a lot of fun working with him. So I am open to that as well. Uh, if you trade back a little bit further, maybe do like around the mid 20s. I think that's when you start taking a look at a guy like uh, uh, Chop from mm -hmm. Penn State. Uh, to me, he's uh, the third best edge in this class. He is somebody who I think has all the potential in the world to be great. It's not yet clear if he'll get there, but I do think he's got a real chance to get there. And I would not mind finding out the hard way, whether or not he does just, just insane, get off at the snap, a ton of bend. Th those are the two most important traits for an edge rusher to me. And um, those would be my main priorities if you trade down into that general area, I think. What are your thoughts on Darius Robinson out of Missouri? He's a guy that that's, would seem to fit from a physical standpoint, could play inside or outside. Um, not the twitchiest, most explosive athlete, but a guy that when you watch the interviews and you hear about the kind of person he is, just screams Seahawk, but he's kind of all over the place. He's He's been mocked in the mid-20s all the way down to the 40 range. What's your take on him? I certainly like him. I have him in my early second round on my uh, final big board. So if we did trade back in the first round and end up with him, I certainly wouldn't be upset about that. I really like him. I don't know exactly how it's going to work in the NFL because he is a much bigger guy than the typical edge rusher in the NFL. He is. Uh, he weighed in at the combine at 285, and he was not particularly athletic when you compare him to other edge players in terms of his uh, explosiveness, his quickness, his speed. So I'm not 100% sure how it works. It could work, but there's also a scenario where he ends up kind of providing snaps at both defensive end, the four eye, and the edge, which there's nothing wrong with that. That's what uh, Draymond Jones does. Draymond Jones goes back yeah. and forth between playing the edge and playing on the inside. And in Denver, it worked very well with us. Last year was a little bit rougher, but there is room in the world for somebody with that versatility. So I like him, certainly. Um, I couldn't quite put him in my first round, but I will say, I think he was, uh, pretty close. And if we do end up with him near the end of the first round, I'm certainly not going to be unhappy about that. It also frees us up to, uh, save 3.1 million on letting Daryl Taylor go, which I think we're going to have to do anyway, because we, we, there's just not a lot of money right now. Yeah, it's an interesting prospect with his lack of guaranteed money that uh, um, I threw out that idea the other day that if they, if they get an edge that they like, especially that they think could could take snaps away from him or they just think is a better player, has a higher ceiling and on a rookie contract, that, that the way the edge class in this draft falls off as well, that there may be some takers for a, a day three pick uh, maybe to take him off your hands. I feel like the farther back they get in the first round, we get into that territory um, – because even if they were to somehow pick up a late two, which is harder than some fans think it is to acquire by just trading back, the later you get in the first round, the greater the chances for a Rashad Penny type surprise. Or even I, I think there was some sentiment about this when they took Jordan Brooks too. That you know we like the player, but that's early. That seems early. And then the Seahawks' justification for that was, well, there was a big ledge after that. We weren't going to get a player like that when we got to pick again. And so you may see it as a reach, but based on our board and, and what we thought was coming up next. And I wonder, I just saw 
a national mock, can't remember whose it was, DJs or Bucky Brooks, one of those guys, had the Seahawks trading down, had them going Edgerin Cooper late first round. And, and this is kind of a suspicion I had that, look, if there's that curveball they're going to throw us, that pick that is widely by the national media considered a reach, but fits a need and is just a player they absolutely love and think is a fit, and I'm thinking of a guy like Junior Colson, even where he's rated kind of generally in the 40s, and they're not going to get him, and they don't want to wait. But he thinks he's he thinks he's that important. Are there is that concern you, or do you think it's realistic that that there could be a reach curveball surprise type move if we move down? I think that it is on the table. At the end of the day, I do want this team to take BPA. But I understand BPA can be subjective at times. I personally am a huge Edgerin Cooper fan. I do actually think he's a back end of the first round, but a first round prospect. Mm. To me, his biggest issue is just the fact that he lacks the instincts that you want at the position, which is something that can be fixed because he is young and because he is relatively new to this limelight here. He was a somebody who wasn't even on my radar to start the season. And then as the year went on, I think he revealed that he is the most talented linebacker in this class. Um, I ended up really liking his game. He doesn't really have any holes in his game physically. So if they wanted to go that route, um, odds are good that when our pick comes up, he would not be the number one player on my board. But I would get it because I think the sky is the limit with him now. I personally feel like his skill set is not exactly what McDonald is looking for. I do think that he is a little more leaning the junior Colson way, which I get. I mean, he he has he coached him two years ago sure. in, at Michigan. So I certainly couldn't blame him for that. But um, I, I think something like that is always on the table. Now, this team has committed pretty hard to the BPA strategy over the last couple of years. And it's worked out very well for them after years of them drafting for need and it not working out so well for them. So I don't know if I see them dropping that. I do think they're going to commit to their board and I am certainly all for that. I, I, that's what I want to see throughout this entire draft personally. Yeah. It's just, uh, it, it's fascinating because we just don't know. And, and Schneider has done what he always does and maybe better than ever this off season, as far as hedging positions, the latest kind of Lake and Tomlinson, I feel like it's kind of the last piece of that where regardless of how you feel about his performance last year in New York and whether that was a product of some dysfunction on offense there or if he's a declining player, or if he still has some in the tank, that, you know, it's 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 hard to see just a glaring, glaring need, except for interior offensive line, which you can make the argument that if they go a different direction in the first round, as much as this is what's fun about the draft being broken up into three days now is, is we get the we get the whole overnight of overreaction to the first round before the second round comes around. Kind of happened last year with the defensive line when the Seahawks went into day three without addressing that position at all. Um, that it's it's not it's not uncommon for fans to to freak out about things like that. But knowing that interior offensive line is one of the deepest positions in this draft. So if they do go a different position, and and you can talk about anyone at other positions as well. But who are some of your favorite guys in this draft after day one? Some of my favorite guys in this draft that I think will be available after day one. Well, if you want to get down into like that round three, maybe even round four area, I've been a longtime uh, fan of Cade Stover, the tight end from mm -hmm. Ohio State. I think he could be like a slightly more athletic Will Disley in the NFL. I think that he's a very reliable pass catcher and somebody who's also a pretty good blocker. He's somebody that I've been into for quite a while now. So I would definitely put him up there on my list as one of the guys that I like a little bit more than most people. Um, I would also say that a guy like uh, Mekai Wingo, the LSU defensive lineman, mm -hmm. is somebody that I would start looking at around the third. Uh, he did not have a very good year last year because he got hurt, didn't play as much as he should have. But um, I look at him and I see a guy who, if Mike McDonald wants a little more undersized defensive lineman, and that's the thing, he may not. It seems to me that Mike McDonald likes bigger guys. You look yeah. at the defensive linemen he had in Baltimore, they were all over 300 pounds. They all were listed at over 300 pounds. I think he likes bigger guys, but if he wants a smaller guy, I'm a fan of Mekai Wingo from LSU. Um, not necessarily a position that we're likely to address, but I also really like Luke McCaffrey the uh, Rice uh, wide receiver 
Same. because he's new to the position. He just yeah. started playing the position two years ago. He's going to get so much better at the little things that he doesn't totally understand yet, the little nuances of the position. And I think there's a lot of talent there. I think in some ways he is more talented than his brother, not as good, but I think that he is uh, somebody who I would consider taking in the early third even. He beat his 40 at the combine. Yes, he did. <laughs> and um, let's see, what else did I like? I, I like Cedric Gray, linebacker. I like Cedric Gray. I would throw him in there as well. Yeah. Uh, tested well enough to justify him as a top 100 pick, I believe. And um, th those would be some of the guys that initially jump out to me as guys that I like a little bit more than typical. Yeah, McCaffrey's a guy that jumped out to me at the at the combine. Just I just he's such natural movements. Look like he'd been playing receiver his whole life. You know, if that's the way he runs routes now, imagine what he can do after you know learning the nuances of the position at the pro level. Um, he became a mock draft favorite of mine in the middle rounds after that. Uh, absolutely, and we're going to talk about Cedric Gray a little bit um, because. Dane Brugler today of The Athletic, who just, uh, man, he's had a big week a couple of days ago, produced his uh, draft guide, The Beast, which is so aptly named one of the best draft guys out, guides out there. He goes as deep uh, and as intricate as anyone. I always love how he incorporates a lot of quotes from scouts, things like that, as much as he can find to get, to get comps on a player, get thoughts on a player. Came out with a full seven-round draft today for the entire league. And I always have so much respect and appreciation for people who put in the work and do this because it takes so much. And it's it's easy to criticize guys that do this because it's impossible to know intimately each and every team the way we know the Seahawks because we we focus on them every day. Uh, and I'm having Shane Hallam of Draft Countdown on Monday, and he does these as well. Uh, and he even does like big boards for 25 and 26. It's insane. But I, I thought it was perfect timing having you on today and that we could put this draft up and show the viewers and we could kind of react to it. Uh, so let's do that now. So this is it. Let's just run through it first. I told you we tipped our hand a little bit. He's got no trades in this one. And he did mention in his description that in the first round at 16, if a guy like this isn't there, he's probably looking to trade back. But if Troy Fautanu is there at 16, he's taking him all day long. He thinks he's a perfect fit for the reasons that we mentioned. And then third round, Jonah Ellis, edge out of Utah. This is an interesting one. Really want to talk to you about this one. Cedric Gray, there you go. You just name dropped him as one of your favorites. Goes back to UW to get the strong safety, Dominique Hampton, who really kind of raised his stock at the Combine. In the sixth round, he goes with a defensive tackle, finally addresses that position, Keith Randolph Jr., Jordan Travis, we get a QB, which is you know one of the big questions. And we'll talk about that a little bit more coming up. And then uh, finishes it off with a tight end, AJ Barner out of Michigan. Your first, uh, your first thoughts when you saw this list. I think this is actually a really good one. This is one that I could definitely get behind as a fan of the Seahawks. I do think Fatanu is maybe the realistic best case scenario for the Seahawks at 16. Um so I, I say that because at the end of the day, I don't think Bowers is actually going to get down to us. I don't think that Odunze, Odunze is going to get down to us. I don't think those guys are going to be there. I think there's a lot of smokescreen stuff going on here. And eventually people are going to be like, wait a minute. I I just watched the tape of Brock Bowers. He is way too good to let fall to 16. So if Fatanu is there and I give him a chance it, to me, Here's the interesting question. If the Jets are picking at 10 and they have Fatanu or they can get Fashanu, the Penn State guy, who do they prefer? Because Fashanu's a guy whose stock has been dipping mm -hmm. over the last couple months. But who would they pick in that scenario? Because presumably they would take one of them. But which one would they prefer? If they like Fashanu, then Fatanu could be there at 16, I think, relatively easily. It, it's uh, To me, that's kind of the uh, pivot point. So I love it. I think it's a great pick. I think that he immediately starts at left guard and gives us better play than we've had there in a while. And he also maybe gives us a little bit of a blanket in case in a couple years we get to the Charles Cross contract negotiations yeah. and he wants $35 million a year or something. And we're like, well, yeah. we could do that or we could just put Fatanu in there. I even think he's athletic enough that even though he's a left side player and has been that, that he could move over to the right side. You know, you think about, uh, now I'm blanking on his name, but the, the kid out of Oregon uh, a couple of years ago, the Lions took, who was a, oh, a Sewell. third pick in the draft, Panay Sewell. 
uh, who was a left tackle, but they have a left tackle moving to the right side. Now, now he's, he's played some left tackle, but he made a pretty seamless transition there and really fortified that line for them, uh, kind of helped them build that foundation. Guys that were still on the board, um, I think both of these are realistic. At 16, when he had him taken, Fautanu, uh, Byron Murphy was still there. Jared Verse was still there. Both of those players at the Seahawks have met with. Um, yeah, Fautanu is... is I, I don't want to just dismiss it as I may have earlier that I don't think he's going to be there at 16 because you never know. It wouldn't take much to shake this draft up. As you were talking about the Jets at 10, I remembered that early in the draft process, there were all these reports about how they were obsessed with and in love with Fuaga out of Oregon State. Now, maybe 10 a little high for him, but if you love a guy, you take him. And if a guy like that jumps into the top 10, it could have a ripple effect and and uh, and drop him down. And And even though, you know, there are those you included that that are convinced he can play tackle. All it takes is a couple of teams in that top fifteen that just aren't sure. And you have all these other tackles in this class that that have a little bit, and they're a little taller, a little longer. That if they just have that doubt, maybe he does get down to sixteen. Um, we get into the third round, and Ellis is a guy that I haven't spent a lot of time studying because I just didn't. I thought. If the Seahawks were looking at edge players in this draft, given the depth on their roster, they're probably looking at longer guys, bigger guys. Ellis is a little smaller, 6'2", 248. He does have 33-inch arms, uh, son of Luther Ellis, so he has the great bloodlines, although he's not nearly as big as his dad was. Um, Brugler has him as the 11th best edge in the class. He was a consensus All-American, all sorts of production, 16 tackles for loss last year, 12 sacks, and he missed three games with a shoulder injury. Uh, he had elite testing marks in the short shuttle and three cone, as well as the vertical and the broad jump. So he's an explosive athlete. Uh, Brugler says he was good enough versus the run shows some ability to stop the run, but he's inconsistent needs work. There says his ceiling is Alex Highsmith. What do you think of that? Yeah, I liked Ellis quite a bit. I do think it's fair to point out that he is a little bit undersized and that McDonald might want somebody with a little bit more going on in that area. But as a player, just speaking objectively, I think this thing that stands out to me is that he's only going to be 21 when the season starts. He's very young, yeah. but he already has legitimate pass rush moves. Like some of these guys you look at coming out of college, they don't have moves. They have speed and or they have power. Maybe they have both, but they don't really have like the the rip move, they don't have the spin move or the swim move or the up and under. This guy's got moves and he's only 21. I'm really impressed by that kind of stuff. High effort goes until the whistle blows. He understands leverage and he's only 6'2". So he understands how to get underneath the pads of these offensive linemen. I like the way he uses his hands. He's got good speed around the edge. My main concern with him is I don't think he has bend, right? Because there are two parts to being a speed rusher off the edge. There's your first step quickness, which I think he has. And then there's the bend. I don't think he has very much bend. And he probably needs to get a little bit stronger so he can stop the run in the NFL. Um, the injuries are a concern. He's been a little bit sidetracked by that. Yeah. Um, I like him a lot. Again, I don't know about the fit. That's a little bit harder to determine. But objectively speaking, I think he's worth about a third round pick. I even said maybe even a little bit early in the third round. So mm -hmm. if this were a pick we made in the third round, this is something that would get me very excited that I would really be into. Now you talk about fit and maybe a, a little bit bigger guy. Uh, Braylon Trice was still on the board at this pick and Dane went with Jonah Ellis of those. Do you think that was the right move given those two? Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's hard to be excited about Braylon Trice at this point. He has uh, really done some unfortunate things to his draft stock with what he did at the combine he's even smaller than um he's even smaller than um ellis and he ran a 47240 with a 165 10 yard split so that's not good enough you're already undersized you can't be running like that and he's got short arms 32 and a half i know i know it's only half an inch but this stuff matters yeah um doesn't really shed blockers that well and he doesn't get leverage in the same way that a guy like Ellis does. He he plays standing straight up. You got to sink your hips. He doesn't do it. And he's two years older than Ellis. So some mm -hmm. of these things that are a problem are more likely to just be part of him. Yeah. Whereas if he was 21, I might believe, okay, he can get better. But 
I'm not a big Braylon Trice fan at this point. It's hard to be. You make a compelling argument. Uh, now we get to talk about one of your favorites that you already mentioned, Cedric Gray. Another another one, one of the younger linebacker prospects in that class. Uh, 6'1", 234, uh, has a basketball background, played some wide receiver earlier in his career as well. Uh, really experienced player, 37 starts at North Carolina, and the production, 30 tackles for loss, eight and a half sacks, six force fumbles, 18 passes defensed, five interceptions, uh, Dane says he's not exceptional in any one area, but he's equal parts athletic and aggressive and is always around the ball. Will compete for starting reps as a rookie. Yeah, yeah, this is a pretty exciting one. Uh, he is a little bit, well, I, I don't even want to call him small. In the modern NFL, linebackers who are 234 pounds, not really that small. Kind of becoming the norm, yeah. Yeah, but there was some fear. I remember talking about Gray um, back in October and November with my subscribers, and there was some concern that he was going to run like a 4.840 because I guess in high school he was slow. Well, he ran a 4.64, which is not elite, but it's certainly workable. So I think that put him back on the table as a top 100 guy. He piled up insanely good numbers over the last two years, maybe more than any other linebacker in the country the straight up stats, like the counting stats, the volume stats are really, really impressive. Uh, pretty good in man coverage. I like how he attacks the run game. I, I, I He's somebody who really knows how to read run blocking and then go to where he needs to go to be in position to uh, interfere with the play. I like the way he slips through blockers. I like the way he works his way through traffic. Uh, sideline to sideline defender. Now, because he is a little bit on the smaller side, a little bit, he does get swallowed up if a blocker lands a clean block on him. He's not going to be doing a lot of shedding, I don't think. Um, he misses a lot of tackles, which is a little more okay when you're making so many. So it's not like his missed tackle rate is off the charts or anything, but he does miss a fair few tackles. And I think that a guy like a Kyle Shanahan might have a little fun with this guy because he's a little overly aggressive and you misdirect him, you run trick plays on him, he will bite down on the first thing he sees, and you can get him a little bit. But that's also something that can be fixed, right? He's only 21. Yeah. So I look at that and I go, he could get better in that area. So his athletic profile isn't on the level of a guy like Cooper or Peyton Wilson, so I can't put him with those guys. But I do think he's a third-round talent, and if you could get him in even the early fourth, that is something that I could sign up for. Kind of like that first fourth round pick the Seahawks have. The second pick of day three gives them a night to sit on it, look at their board, maybe even maneuver around a little bit if they feel like that's what they need to do. The, the thing I like about Gray is uh, some of his interceptions on tape aren't just the typical uh, inside linebacker interceptions where the quarterback doesn't see you drop into a zone. He, he, he's got some athletic, like making – athletic movements to to pick balls off high pointing balls kind of taking balls that are thrown behind him that kind of thing that's kind of fun uh another husky now dominic campton you, you figure at some point in this draft just like with linebacker the seahawks would want to address safety as they only have one well two if you include it jarek reed under contract beyond this year um dominic campton is a guy led the uw huskies in tackling zero in or zero sacks in his career um, he's played some box, but even at his size, 6'2", 213, they, they did play him deep in coverage at times. Uh, Dane says he's undisciplined in man responsibilities, but impressive side speed combo, diagnoses well from zone, and is an explosive striker as a tackler. Yeah, that's a lot of what I had as well. I do like him. I will say that I watch every Huskies game. I watch, I've watched pretty much every play of this guy's career at Washington. And my initial impression of him was not that he was going to be a round four type guy. Now, when he went to the combine and tested as well as he did, combined with how big he is, I I said, you know, this is now a round four guy approximately in all likelihood. I, di I do acknowledge that. But on the field, it doesn't look as good as it does when you're wearing your underwear on in Lucas Oil. <laughs> so... You take this guy, you're definitely betting on your coaching staff to be able to develop him properly. You are hoping that they can get more out of him than uh, his college coaches did. Uh, his combination of size, length, and general athletic ability is very rare. I like his instincts in deep safety. And it's very important to remember here, 
when you are a safety in a Mike McDonald defense, you need to do it all. Mm -hmm. You can't just be a deep safety or a box safety or else you're, you're not going to get it done because his safeties are supposed to be ubiquitous. They're supposed to be able to do everything. So when you look at a guy with this size, who is a hard hitter, who can also play the deep safety role, it's a really good fit. Um, and there are not a lot of safeties in this class who would be a good fit for that. A lot of them, I think, do have narrow use cases. Um, he is shaky in man coverage. I do agree with that. Uh, his tackle fundamentals aren't great. I know he racked up a lot of tackles, but he's also got a lot of opportunities when you think about it. When Washington has the uh, the offense that they have had the last two years, you're going to have to do a lot of stuff on defense because the other team is just going to have to keep passing, trying to keep up. But um, I think he's going to have to get coached up heavily to get to where he could be. But if you believe in your coaches, he's probably going to be a good NFL player. And I'm on board with this one as well. Another one of the older players. He'll be 24 during the season. Uh, you might not like this, though. Some of the players taken after Dominic Hampton, um, Luke McCaffrey, Kate Stover, two of your favorites. Uh, there was a big run on running backs uh, right after him. And uh, Jalen McMillan of uh, University of Washington, surprisingly, was still on the board in mm -hmm. uh, Dane's draft. We go down to the sixth round. Uh, Seattle finally addresses defensive linemen, taking a former uh, teammate and actually recruiting classmate of Devin Witherspoon out of Illinois. Keith Randolph was their se seventh rated recruit that year. Devin Witherspoon was number one. He's got a big basketball background. Uh Played in 42 games last season, uh, last three seasons, 144 tackles, 22 and a half tackles for loss, 10 sacks, a forced fumble, six passes defensed, and two interceptions for the big guy. He was a team captain. We know how much Seahawks value that. Uh, Dane says, missing an explosive element, but he's disciplined and consistent in the run game. This sounds like the kind of value that you're looking to find on the interior defensive line on day three. Yeah, this one seems pretty much all right to me. I did take a look at Keith Randolph Jr. Um, one thing that I think stands out about him is that he's a pretty good gap shooter. Like in 2022, he had 13 tackles for loss as a 300-pound lineman. That's actually very impressive. Now, last year, his play was much worse, but that's because Illinois lost all their best defenders except for Jerzon Newton. They lost Witherspoon. They lost both of their safeties. Mm -hmm. Um I, what was his name? Jartavius Martin. Um, maybe it wasn't Martin, but they lost pretty much everything. And they had the number one defense in the country in 2022. And they were awful last year to give an idea of how badly that dropped off. But he's uh, pretty good. He understands leverage really well, even though he's six foot three and a half. He knows how to sink his hips and get low. Um, but he's not much of an athlete. I don't think he's a very good block shedder. Uh, not very quick off the snap. He's definitely an early down player. He doesn't really offer much of anything as a pass rusher to me. Um, he was able to do some cleanup sacks last uh, two years ago, but last year it regressed back to where, well, I kind of expected it to be. So he belongs in the league. I think he's worth a look at about the sixth round or so. Um, I do suspect that when we get down to this area, there will be at least one player I can find that I am more excited by than Keith Randolph Jr., but he's all right. Some of the guys he was taken in front of, Jaden Crumity, another defensive lineman, Mississippi State, uh, Jaheim Bell, a kind of H-back the Seahawks have met with, Nathaniel Watson, inside linebacker they've met with. Uh, there's some other defensive line prospects as well. McKinley Jackson was still on the board, a guy that we know the Seahawks have met with as well. Um, and in fact, he was still on the board when they took their second sixth-round pick uh, under Dane uh, Brugler. They finally go quarterback. We've been talking about it for a long time. Uh, Jordan Travis saw a video of him just the other day, uh, dropping back, not wearing a brace on his leg, looking you know healthy, moving around pretty well after that pretty gnarly broken leg that he suffered that ended his season last year with Florida State. Uh, in the sixth round of the guys that are going to be available, what do you think of Jordan Travis? I was really liking Jordan Travis last year. He was somebody who brought it every single game. He was somebody who, more than anybody in this draft, reminded me of what Russell Wilson was coming out of college. There's a lot of parallels you can make there, actually, I think. And things were going great, and then he he broke his leg. But still, I'll say this. He was creeping up toward my second round before he got hurt. Hmm. So if you could get this guy in the sixth round, I think that's phenomenal value, and you got to jump on it. you got to do it at that point. I am... Uh, to be clear, I am not somebody who pounds the drum for quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. We need a quarterback right now. 
But if you can get somebody like this, who I still consider to be a fourth round level prospect in okay. the sixth round, then I am all over that. I, I think his arm is better than you would expect for a quarterback who is this small. Yeah. Like usually these smaller quarterbacks kind of have noodles. This guy does not have a noodle at all. A lot of mobility and escapability. Watching him will remind you of Russell Wilson. He's good off platform. He's got good pocket presence. He's got that like almost Jedi sense in the pocket that we see with saw with Russell. We see with Caleb Williams now. Now the injury is a concern. I do have some issues with the more cerebral parts of the game. Like I think he has some issues pre-snap, hmm. but he's really fun. And I think that if he can stay healthy, he is going to be a starter at some point in this league. So I'm all over that in the sixth round all day. Yeah, he's been he's been my QB seven all off season, even ahead of Spencer Rattler, who I know a lot of fans love. Uh, Max Brown came on my show and name dropped him as kind of a guy he might see in that Brock Purdy steal sort of category later in the draft. Uh, Emory Hunt has him as his fourth quarterback in this. I'm glad you said that about his arm because I keep reading the scouting reports that he doesn't have an NFL arm, and that's not what I see on tape. I was going to do a film breakdown on him this week after I saw the video of him being healthy, but with what YouTube's doing with their crackdown on all 11 or all 22 uh, right now, probably won't be able to do that, but there's tight window throws, there's back shoulder throws, there's throws on the move. Uh, you talk about his his movement skills. He broke Charlie Ward's QB rushing records at FSU. Pretty impressive. And last two seasons, you could see the advancement as a passer, 64% completions, 44 touchdowns, only seven interceptions, also ran for 31 touchdowns. Really, really productive player. Uh, picked ahead of Joe Milton in uh, in Dane's draft. Oh, that's tough for me because I also am intrigued by Milton, but I acknowledge that it's probably not happening. But here's the thing with Milton. You can move him to tight end. If he doesn't work out at quarterback, you can move him to tight end. I think he can do it. Interesting. So kind of that's a, tough. Who is that Logan Thomas? Who was that? Yeah. Is, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then they finish out with tight end. You know, it's, this would seem to be, depending on how many picks they end up with, um, maybe not a glaring need. Let's take a, a Brock Bowers high in the draft like you talked about, but certainly something that, you know, they really only have two guys. Uh, when, when your third quarterback is, or your third tight end is Brady Russell, um, as much as he shows a little bit of upside in the passing game, you're probably looking for a guy in the draft. And A.J. Barner in the seventh, 6'6", 251, the largest wingspan of all the tight ends. Indiana transfer. He was a team captain at Indiana, but when you transfer your last season to Michigan and all those alphas, tough to crack that team captain list. Uh, but really productive. Almost matched his numbers from Indiana the year before at Michigan. Um, seems like, again, really good value in the seventh round for a guy who's a solid two-way tight end, um, has some defensive experience in his background. You can see that in the way he blocks. Yeah, yeah. Um, he is an excellent inline blocker. That's his main skill set. That's the main thing he's bringing to the table here. And if you got him, that's the main reason why you would. And we do have a, uh, um, a pharaoh. Pharaoh uh, Brown mm -hmm. is considered to be one of the better blocking tight ends in the league, but uh, he's a one-year deal. And right now, the way I see it, our third tight end is basically George Fant. I think that he would actually, I don't expect Brady Russell to be on the, uh, on the active roster when the season starts. I think we're just going to use Fant in that role. Um, so you get somebody like uh, AJ Barner. I do view him as a guy who will eventually be a tight end too, because he's a really good blocker. Uh, he's a hard worker, good size, long arms, good big catch radius. Um, there is some lack of refinement that I think needs to be fixed in his game, like uh, his hand placement when he's blocking, but that's easy to fix. I would expect a competent coaching staff to be able to fix that. And obviously he's never going to be like a downfield playmaker. He doesn't have great hands, but we also have to remember here that anybody who plays on Michigan's offense yeah. He's going to have depressed numbers because they don't throw the ball because they're always up by eight touchdowns in the third quarter. And probably he's coming into the league more pro ready than most of these tight ends because Michigan's about as close as it gets with what Harbaugh oh, yeah. was doing there. I, th I thought it was interesting too. Dane remarked just kind of talking about his body at 6'6", 251, but he said he thought his frame kind of looked uh, sort of unfinished and and maybe you know a pro weight program uh, that he could add a little bit of good weight and, and become even stronger. So thought that was interesting uh guys that were picked after him not you know at this point in the draft it's tough to find any value but uh michael barrett inside linebacker out of michigan a lot of people like and obviously mike 
uh, McDonald knows. And then uh, a couple of intriguing running backs, which I think would make a lot of sense in the seventh round, especially given Bryant Kobach's retirement. Uh, Kamani Vidal, nation's leading rusher last year out of Troy, and Dylan Johnson, who obviously Ryan Grubb and Scott Huff know from, from UW, taken after, uh, after him. Um, not too bad. Of the national drafts that I've seen, um, I, these are a lot of guys that I take when I typically mock, except for Ellis, but it, it caused me to go back and look at him a little bit this morning, and I'm going to look at him some more after what you said. And, and uh, intriguing, intriguing player with a lot of upside. Um, I would not yeah. be, I would not be mad about this draft. Not at all. Uh, let's finish on this. If there's, if there's one curveball, like one thing that the team might do next week during the draft at any point that might surprise people that we don't see coming. Have you given any thought to what that might be? Um, I do think that there is the possibility here that the team decides to go for a defensive back early, like maybe in the first round. Uh, there are a couple of guys in that range. There's no safety this year. It's a pretty weak safety yeah. class at the top. But I do think that you could see the team take Quinion Mitchell at, tw- at, at, at uh, 16. I think he's the best corner in this class. And I think you could see a small trade back to get Cooper Dijon. I think both those things are on the table. I think that McDonald likes a certain type of defensive back in his defense. And while we may really like some of these defensive backs on the team, we don't know what he thinks of them because he right. inherited all this. Right. And I, I think that goes for almost anybody on this team. Everybody is inherited. Nobody on this staff was here except for Carl Scott when these guys were picked. So I'm pretty sure that Mike McDonald likes Devin Witherspoon because he's just so good all around that it would be really hard to find a reason to not like him. I'm pretty sure he likes him, but does he like Reek Woolen? I'm not so sure about that. I have wondered about that. Mm -hmm. Hasn't hasn't really talked about him much. Mm -hmm. Hasn't name dropped him. Yeah. Um, Does he like Kobe Bryant? I don't know. Maybe nobody likes Kobe Bryant because he didn't play that well last year, but maybe he looks at Kobe Bryant as somebody who he doesn't really know what to do with because there's not enough going on. Uh, he likes Mike Jackson enough to give him the $3 million tender, but does he like him as a long-term option? I don't know. So it would probably get people riled up if we took a defensive back in the first round, but part of me is ready for it. And if it's the right guy, I'm going to be on board with it too. If it's Quinion Mitchell, I'm on board because I think he's that good. If it's Cooper Dijon in the twenties, I'm on board because I think he's that good. It's, it's fascinating. And especially if we find out that Mike McDonald intends on playing Witherspoon more inside and having him close to the line of scrimmage and being that guy, then there may be guys in this draft, like you say, that that he likes better as potential lockdown corners on the outside than a Trey Brown or a Mike Jackson or, or a Reek Woolen, which, uh, man, if they took a guy at 16 and, and you've mentioned Quinion Mitchell a couple of times, the, the most common mock or, or comp that I see for him is Devin Witherspoon in his play, in play style. And fascinating to me that when you put on the tape, he's in college, they didn't ask him to play any press man. In fact, in most often he's playing way off, but yet he goes to the senior bowl and in press man, it looks like he's been playing it his whole life and, and right. just love doing it. And I could see, imagine this, if they go, if they were to stick and pick at 16, they take a guy like Quinion Mitchell. Then you'd have to wonder day two, as the cornerbacks start to come off the board, like if he, if he, if this is a reflection of how he feels about Reek Woolen, are they making phone calls, right? Is there some interest in him around the league in order to recoup a, a pick or two? Um, that would open up a big Pandora's box among, among the fan base for sure. Yeah, people tend to get a little riled up when you start talking about things like that, but I'm not completely ruling it out. I, I would prefer not to. I think he was injured last year, playing through an injury, working through that, and I think that affected him negatively. I think that he can get better in some of these areas, but at the same time, I, I wanted this co- new coaching staff. I wanted a new set of eyes on this roster. So when something like that happens, you have to be willing to live with the results. And sometimes the results are, they turn the roster over a little bit more than you expected. Yeah. And I'm down with that. And as of right now, this Seahawks team, in my opinion, does not have a great roster. We could use help in a lot of places. So I am going to be very open to drafting just about anybody, regardless of position, as long as I think the player is worth the value of the pick. 
Well said. Brendan Nelson, his YouTube channel, Seahawks Brendan Nelson. I really appreciate you coming on the show. I know viewers are going to love it. We're going to get a lot of comments applauding uh, this guest spot from you today. Uh, thanks for doing that. Let the viewers know what you got coming up between now and the draft. Well, I finished all the uh, pre-draft uh, individual evaluations of prospects over the uh, last couple of months. So that's all done. So now what I'm just doing is putting it all into uh, positional big boards. So those are the videos that are going up. I'm going to be tracking um, top 30 visits as the Seahawks continue to use them. I think today might actually be the last day for them. So it's possible that after today, that'll be a wrap. Um, so I'm going to be tracking that. And then we're going to do one of these nights. I'm going to do a mock draft of Palooza, basically just go around to all the mock draft simulators on the internet and a live stream going through them. Uh, I try to do that every year. It's pretty fun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you checked out, uh, Mo walk the mock yet? I have not. I'm not familiar with that one. Okay, try that one out. It's new. They're the new guy on the on the block, and I really like what they're doing. Uh, they're really receptive to input, too. It's a cool interface. Uh, just a warning, it's better on your computer than it is on your phone right now. Um, it's just a cool way it looks. But the, the thing I like as well, when you go to... Um, their big board's okay, but you can import your own if you want to, or just rearrange theirs. Uh, and then when you go to suggest trades or offer trades, it brings up the Jimmy Johnson trade value for each pick. So you just check boxes and it does the math for you. So you don't have to go back and forth another window and check it against the trade chart. It's it's new kid on the block, but the, they're doing some good things. Cool. And uh, that's pretty much going to take us to the draft. Um, uh, that That's uh, really about all there is right? It's just yeah. putting all the pieces together in place. I posted my final big board one through, I think 287 on, uh, my, uh, Patreon and my uh, community tab. So that stuff's up now as well. So basically we're just uh, waiting. If we have a top 30 visit with somebody I didn't look at, maybe I'll go look at them and add them. But uh, yeah. other than that, I'm just waiting for the draft to get here at this point. Good. Well, make sure and follow him on Twitter so that, uh, you get his link tree link and then you can find his Patreon and all the things he does. Love, love the work that you do, Brendan. Thanks, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. I appreciate doing this. That was cool. Always love chopping it up with uh, in-depth draft stuff. It's always fun to have someone on the show that I know I can ask him any question about the draft, and uh, and they won't be uh, they won't be surprised by it. They'll be prepared for it. They'll have a really great answer for it. Um, some guests you have to do a little more prep with ahead of time, but uh, not Brendan. So check his channel out. I'll put all that information in the description as well. Coming up on the show, a couple of really cool things next week. Uh, Curtis Allen, who you see contribute to Rob Staten's blog. We're going to get into some draft stuff and we'll talk some salary cap as well. He's really, really adept at that and sort of how they're going to come up with some money to sign some of these draft picks uh, and where he thinks things are going to go. Shane Hallam is going to join me on Monday. One of the very, very first draft guys that I ever followed way back in the early days of Twitter. And uh, he, as I mentioned on the show, he, he goes really, really deep. We're even going to talk about the 2025 quarterback class a little bit and how it might relate to what the Seahawks may do this year. So that's coming up as well. And then I've been asking for your viewer mock drafts. I've been saving those. Continue to send me those on Twitter with screenshots of what you came up with. And I'll be doing that uh, here in the next couple of days. Also, geez, as if there isn't enough happening, uh, Clinton Bonner is going to be joining me uh, from Seahawkers Podcast. And uh, and the guys from uh, Hawk Zone Rundown are going to come on Sunday as well. So a lot coming up. Make sure and hit that notification button, that bell, so you don't miss any of those. Until next time, forever and always, go Hawks. Thanks for watching.